Okay, so now we're going to begin our section in Monopoly. This will be the first three videos covering a way that economists think about Monopoly and what we really mean by Monopoly. So to begin, when we mean by Monopoly is we mean a, a firm or company with market power. We are now going to pull away from our pure competition, our perfect competition, and we're going to say that companies can have market power, which is one way of saying they can influence the price. So it has some sort of market power. There's a couple of ways to think about it. They're interrelated, so they all kind of mean the same thing. Uh, they can make economic profit in the long run. They can keep their price well above average total cost for that particular unit. And they do it by being able to influence the price, by constraining output. How are they able to do this? Well, because we are no longer in that pure competition world. Monopolies always have to have some sort of barrier to entry. It's the only way that they can say, we're going to cut down on our production and we're going to keep prices up. Well, the only reason why that doesn't inspire people to enter and encourage people to enter is because they can't enter. There's some sort of barrier to entry. That is the defining aspect of what makes a monopoly. And we don't want to get too hung up on labels and categories. There's really a spectrum, right? At some basic level, as we'll discuss, all companies have some kind of market power. They all have some sort of influence. Like, well, lots of fast food restaurants make hamburgers. Only McDonald's can make a Big Mac. Right? By law, only McDonald's can make a Big Mac. Right? Because it's a copyrighted item. Is that a big deal? Probably not. But there is that monopoly power there. There is that barrier to entry. And that barrier to entry gives the incumbent companies some sort of influence on the price. It can be very, very small influence, but it's you know, not perfect. And again, a lot of monopolies too, and especially in this case, there's differentiation in products. So often those go hand to hand. Um, in this case, you know, a burger is not, a Big Mac is not the same thing as a Whopper that kind of thing. So now we don't have homogenous products anymore. So we're sort of pulling apart our pure competition diagram, right? We might not have uh, lots of uh, buyers and sellers, right? We might only have one seller, which is in the strict definition, a monopoly, mono meaning one. We're going a bit broader. I'm going to say it just has a company with uh, some sort of market power. Uh, maybe it gets this because it has this explicit barrier to entry. Maybe that entry, that barrier to entry is sort of baked into uh, products not being all the same. So there's some product differentiation. Maybe that barrier to entry is a little bit different, maybe more explicit as we'll discuss. But this is sort of the world we're working with. This is in some ways more descriptive of our world. In some ways it's not like when people think monopoly, they think absolutely no competition whatsoever. And even it's hard to eliminate all competition at all. Even at some basic level, like, I don't know if someone is complaining that you know, computer chip manufacturers are a monopoly because there's only like maybe, well, let's imagine there's only one computer chip manufacturer. On one hand, they're the only people making computer chips and, and uh, processors. But at some level, people who make processes are competing with people who make books. Because a big reason why people get processors is to play video games. And video games are a form of entertainment. And a substitute to video games, then, is books. You can read instead of play a video game. You can watch TV instead of playing a video game. You can learn to cook instead of playing a video game. So what really is a monopoly and, and what isn't can also be an issue of debate. Like, what does it mean to be a competitor? All right, there's a spectrum. It's complicated. We're not going to get too far into that. We're going to mostly just think in terms of monopolies in the more conventional sense. But just to, if you're curious about the extension, that's a conversation we sometimes have. What does it really mean to be a competitor? Now, to understand the sources of monopoly power, so we're going to have to take a step back. I use the term long run a lot, in case you have a long run versus short run. 
And there's lots of ways to distinguish between the two. But a really important way that we often distinguish long run versus short run in micro is when we think in terms of variable or fixed costs. In the short run, we have some costs that are fixed costs. Think like of a factory. Like you build the factory, whether you produce uh, 100 wash machines or 1,000 wash machines a year, the factory is the same factory. You don't have to make more factories. Your output, your, your costs to make that factory are the same regardless of your output. But of course, in practice, if you wanted to go from like a thousand wash machines, like a million wash machines, you're going to need to build more factories. That is not something you're going to be thinking about in the short run. You know, whether we're talking maybe like a week or a month from now. But if you're thinking in terms of your company's major plans, then that is a variable cost. That's a variable cost, no different than the materials, no different than the workers you'd have to hire. In the long run, all costs are variable costs. Nothing's fixed. Because if you're going to scale up, then you're going to have to incur costs that normally we think is something that's just one and done. Now, I think in practice, there's probably some exceptions to this. Like, once you've designed your logo, it literally doesn't matter how much more you, you produce. You're kind of done designing your logo. You might mix it up some for marketing purposes, but as far as actual production, you don't have to. Uh, naming your company and so forth, like those kinds of things. But in patents too, same thing with patents. But generally speaking, um, all costs are going to be variable costs of the long run. One way to sort of visualize this is to imagine a series of short run average total cost curves. Like there might be one here when production is low. But then as you produce more and more and more, uh, the lowest point actually falls. Maybe you get better specialization of labor. You're able to hire individual people that can that can really focus on one particular part of your production of your washing machine or your dolls or whatever it is. You get better facilities and facilities that can specialize. But eventually the lowest part of that cost curve is pretty constant. You're not getting better as you expand, but you're not getting worse. But then there's this thing that happens when a company gets really large. And it becomes hard to manage everything. You have to have people check each other and you have to introduce a lot of bureaucracy. Are you taking advantage of our system? Are you handling things well? Are you finding the people you need to talk to? It's not just merely an asymmetric information we have to police you issue. It's just a logistics question of if you have, you know, a million different employees. It's just hard to figure out what you need to do on a daily basis. This is why some websites get really hard to navigate because they have to cover lots of different things. And that creates costs and that slows things down. If we collect all, connect all these different points, we have three distinct areas where the average costs are decreasing as the output expands. We call these economies of scale. We have areas where the costs are increasing as output expands. We call these diseconomies of scale. And then we have our center part. Well, they're not increasing nor decreasing, which we unimaginably call constant returns to scale. So we have economies of scale where costs are decreasing as output expands, then they're flattened out, costs are the same as output expands, then they are increasing as output expands, diseconomies of scale. Well, what the hell does this have to do with monopolies? 
Turns out a lot. Let's imagine you're going to build a dam, a big dam to generate power. You would generate so much power, you could probably generate enough power to handle the electrical needs of every major city in the 100 mile radius. Dams are huge cost items, huge upfront fixed costs. But once you swallow that cost, then it's very easy to produce for the rest of the market. In other words, for the entire demand curve, they face economies of scale. For the whole thing, uh, the costs per unit sold keep falling even as they provide more and more people because they had that huge upfront cost, that fixed cost, and then as the quantity increases, then each person can, can shoulder a smaller and smaller part of that, so the costs per output fall. You know, when fixed costs are huge, then as output expands, average fixed cost is always falling. And if it's largely automated, you know, like you might have a couple of people, maybe more, but not, you know, you're still your average total costs are, are are really low. The only way anyone can compete with you is if they also built a massive dam, which is really expensive to do. So once that dam is made, you have the potential to be a monopoly. You are what we call a natural monopoly. You can always outprice a competitor. There's also import control. De Beers had a lot of monopoly power, a lot of market power on diamonds for a long time because they owned the vast majority of diamond mines. And there was no way to artificially create diamonds like there are now. So if you wanted a diamond, you basically always had to go through De Beers. And they were able to establish some sort of monopoly power and constrain how much they were available and thus bring the price of diamonds up. They controlled a key input. Again, this really only works for... Uh, inputs that are very hard to find or there's just this there's not a lot of places to be able to produce them so it's, it's hard to imagine anyone having like input control over water which literally falls from the sky i don't know how you would do that but for certain like where earth element elements or for diamonds which are very difficult to find only occur in a certain number of places, it's conceivable someone could buy up all the mines like De Beers did. A really common source of monopoly power that was legal. Laws literally prevent entry. There is some sort of barrier to entry that the government has erected. Like, it's hard to become a doctor, not just because the training is difficult, but because you have to get approval from the, I mean, to be licensed from the American Medical Association. Licensing in general is a major source of some kind of market power, not necessarily a monopoly in that truth There's only one provider, but it is a barrier to entry that makes, that makes it good for people who are already in the firm, who are already in the industry, I should say. If you wanted to become, you know, in some states, an interior designer, you have to be licensed by law. You're not allowed to do this job unless you've had a certain amount of, of formal training and education, have been uh, have a certain level, num amount of experience, maybe working with somebody, swallowed all these upfront costs. Those are barriers to entry. Hairdressers have this problem. It's a major problem, uh, these licensing requirements. And it's not just licensing. Uh, lots of times there are barriers, uh, like, oh, a really good one is um, certificates of need. So if you want to build a hospital or you want to build a medical facility of some kind, you have to get permission from pre-existing medical providers in your area. I know it's weird, but it's, it's the law in, in a lot of uh, U.S. states. You have to demonstrate that they need this, that the community needs this. So it's like, can you imagine having to get permission from other restaurants when you want to own a restaurant, when you want to open a new one? Like, it's, it's hard to get this permission, as one would expect.
any sort of barriers to trade is another form of that whether it's a tariff whether it's a quota because it's preventing entry a land use requirements prevent entry making it harder to build uh, that's why housing in a lot of urban areas is so very expensive it's because it's really hard by law to add new housing and what's crazy about it is that if some developer wants to add housing uh, local residents often get really upset, especially if it's high density housing. And they will work to try to block or at least shrink the size of that housing. Um, in part, you know, maybe they don't like the aesthetics, maybe they're concerned about crowding of schools, maybe they don't want the traffic. But another reason is because they don't want the competition. Homeowners, generally speaking, uh, try to stop additional development. Land use restrictions, laws make it difficult, make it illegal to build affordable housing. You know, if the land is really, really valuable, the only way that low income housing can uh, buy that land, can justify that land, is if there's a lot of units. A lot of units is high density, and laws prevent high density. A lot of laws make affordable housing illegal, they prevent entry and thus housing prices go up because there's a constraint on supply. And it's gonna be the same thing too, De Beers constrains supply. It'll be the same thing for a natural monopoly. They constrain supply and they bring those prices up. Does that mean that monopoly in all forms are inherently bad and that we should try to go to a world of pure competition? No. Because like I said, pure competition is a boring world. Everything is the same. No one wants to live in that world. So in practice, we do kind of want to strike a balance, especially since, you know, as we'll diagram, the nice, the, the thing about monopolies is that the, um, the reason why people want them is because they create monopoly profits, long run monopoly profits, profits that are not reduced by, uh, by a competition. So maybe a little bit of that profit is kind of nice because it does create an incentive. And one way to think about this is a seemingly oxymoronic term. No, that's... One way to think about this is a seemingly oxymoronic term, monopolistic competition. On one hand, there are lots of competitors. On one hand, there are lots of people just like we would see in the competition. Lots of sellers of a good. At the same time, we're gonna allow some product differentiation. We're not gonna say that literally all products have to be the same. So homogeneity of products is not necessary. So if one firm discovers some unique edge of another firm, oh, and that's another thing too. So on one hand, we have lots of competition, just like in pure competition. We have freedom of entry, just like in pure competition. But Monopoly says, though, those, but unlike pure competition, we're gonna have some product differentiation. We're not gonna live in a world where literally everything is the same. We're gonna allow people to differentiate the products, or we, I don't say allow, because it's, it's allowed, but, we are going to recognize that companies differentiate. So this is sort of a hybrid between the two. It's monopoly in the sense that not everything's the same. So you can sort of let your company, you let your firm stand out. You can be the sole provider of say the Big Mac or something, but you do have competitors, people who are selling things that are similar, even if not identical. And you have freedom of entry. Uh, they might have a Big Mac, but they won't call it a Big Mac, they might call it something else. Similar, but not identical. So, no, we don't want to necessarily say all monopolies are always bad. By having those monopoly profits, you create incentives. Right? That product differentiation. So that product differentiation allows companies to make some amount of monopoly profits. And that's good because it creates an incentive for them to innovate. Innovation is hard and it's risky and it's expensive to, it's a, it's a fixed cost that you have to swallow. And sometimes it can be really big. So if you don't give them some sort of extra advantage, 
then they might not do it at all. Oh, one example of this is patents. Patents are so important that they're actually written into the U.S. Constitution. It's one of the few areas that, that is explicit, like the U.S. has the ability to establish a patent system. On one hand, patents are monopolies. They're legal monopolies. That's literally their function. The government gives a certain company exclusive rights over this idea, over the ability to produce a touchscreen or the ability to produce a drug, and that creates obviously some problems. Right? That's a monopoly. That's bad, right? to lack of a better word. So why did they establish it? It's because they wanted to create an incentive to innovate. Right? There is this legitimate concern that if you don't allow people to have monopoly power, don't give them this profits, then they won't invent stuff. This is contentious. It does depend on what we're talking about. For something like a lot of little changes uh, that are not very expensive to develop, it's not really clear how valuable patents are. But for things like medical drugs, which come with a lot of testing and a lot of research, and it's very, 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 very expensive to make, then yeah, you probably do need patents in order to make that happen. The problem is patents can be too strong. The monopoly power can be too strong. The compensation can be overly large. And so you can have the opposite problem of, yes, you did create it, but you gave them too much monopoly power. And the compensation you're giving them is just not worth it. You know, you're, you're essentially overpaying. So insulin is a really great example of this. Um, people talk about how insulin is this very, very old technology, and it is. It is. But early insulin is not easy to take. You know, you have to take it at very precise times. Uh, it's, it's, takes a, you have to plan ahead a lot, so it's not fast-acting. So biotech companies, much to their credit, figured out a way to make fast-acting insulin so you don't have to take it. You, know, you have to say, oh, I'm going to plan to eat in like two hours from now. You know, and that's amazing, right? And they did that because they wanted to make monopoly power, right? They wanted to get a patent, and they did get patents. The problem is the patent system can be manipulated. And so the reason why insulin prices get very, very, very high is because despite these patents being now pretty old and should have expired, there are ways to manipulate the system to slightly change things and extend patents. And so now some of these firms uh, while much of the credit they invented this stuff in the first place, much to their shame, they're really gaming the system and going beyond what was really intended. Right? It's a monopoly. Economist named Michael Creamer recently won the Nobel Prize in Economics of 2019. He did his work in development, but he also had this other paper that was really influential called Patent Bio. So you can Google it, you can find it. Uh, it essentially said one way to solve this patent problem is to have the government purchase the patent and then rip up the patent and release it into the public domain. You preserve the incentive to innovate by giving companies you know, this block of money that they get from the government. But then you also avoid the monopoly power because then the government just then passes on. Now, the tricky part is figuring out how to value a patent. And in the paper, he discusses that the way you could do this is by having an auction and letting people bid on the patents, you know, maybe having these regular auctions where people can bid back and forth on patents uh, they're trying to sell and the companies can buy it. And it is this, this market activity happens. And then every once in a while, maybe at random times, the government swoops in and purchases a patent for, say, twice the value that normally is, because that, that's roughly the social value, the conservative estimate of the social value. So twice as much as, as what the highest bidder says, and, and, and then rips it up. So in other words, it uses the market mechanism of, of the auctions to figure out the value of something. But it can't swoop in all the time, because if everyone knows that the government's just going to buy it, then that's going to change how people bid for things. So 
every once in a while, maybe for some key ones or maybe at random, they will grab the patent and rip it up. This is nice too because not only do you remove the monopoly, but a lot of inventions follow from other inventions. And so if you create some sort of like, like let's imagine I created a better insulin system, well, I would not, I would um, have trouble developing it because I would need permission from people, sometimes many people who have related have related patents. So this like what we call the patent thicket can actually constrain innovation completely. Right? Not only do we have this issue of we're producing less of the product that we would like because the monopoly is constraining production, but we're also producing less innovation less invention because of downstream derivative interventions that make it difficult to uh, produce because of this constraint upstream of these, these more fundamental ideas. So this is something that a lot of economists talk about and think about, and it's a really tricky problem because you are trying to balance between these two things. So in this monopolistic competition system, uh, you know, on one hand, it's good. We have lots of competition but we also create an incentive for innovation. So it's a nice balance. It'll be a theme that we discuss. First, we have to develop our monopoly model. And that's what we'll do next time.